We are going to James chapter 4 this morning for our seventh part. We are in our seventh part of the book of James, and we find ourselves in James chapter 4. Quick hands up if you've been enjoying the series so far, those that have been following along. It has been a blessing to many of us, and I'm sure that it is going to be no different this morning as we jump into James chapter 4, and we're going to begin reading verse 1 in just a few moments. The title of this morning's message is Humility Cures Worldliness. What does humility do? It cures worldliness. Last week, we had a comparison between worldly wisdom and wisdom that is heaven sent. And we see today that James is going to continue talking on this theme, and we are going to see that humility cures worldliness. And as we get in, we are going to see one of the strongest rebukes that we find in the New Testament. And I'm sure you're all looking forward to that. We have seen throughout our uh, series going through the book of James that the clothes have changed, that the outward appearance may have changed, but not much else. The outward appearance has changed, meaning that the things that James is talking about to his audience back in the first century, the, the things that he is talking about, it may have changed on the outward appearance. But at the heart, we are still facing the same issues. Can we say amen to that, church? We are still facing the same issues today that James was dealing with with his audience there in the first century. The clothes have changed, but not much else. James' rebuke of worldliness has everything to do with what it produces. We are going to see today, just like last week, that James, as he continues to rebuke his congregation that is spread out in the diaspora there in the, the um, Near East, that James is going to show us that he is more worried about what is, what is being produced by their worldliness than by the way that they are actually conducting themselves. In other words, James is worried about where the rubber meets the road. It's not so much about what they're thinking, but about the way that they're relating to one another. And as we have seen through the book of James, this continues to come out, that James, although he has a rigid theology, although he has a very tight theology, that he is worried primarily about its practice, about the where the rubber meets the road, the way that we relate to one another as Christians, as as human beings today. We saw again last week that wisdom is seen in conduct, not in comprehension. Wisdom is seen in conduct, not in comprehension, meaning that there is no one that is to be turned away from the gospel. There is no one that is discredited from receiving this heaven-sent wisdom that God is willing to give to all liberally, just because of comprehension, a lack of comprehension. It's conduct where wisdom is seen, not in comprehension. Let's turn to James chapter 4 and get into verse 1 here. James chapter 4 and verse 1. James starts out, Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? Where do wars and fight come from? Fights? James is speaking to his congregation. Do we believe that there were literally wars breaking out in the congregations where one fraction or family would break off and start warring and killing the other fraction? Is that what we see taking place in James's congregations that he's speaking into? James is talking here on two different levels, and we're going to see that very clearly as we get into our message today. So, so the language suggests that James is talking on two different levels. We see here that wars and fights come from among you. Wars and fights. Were there literally wars and fights? No. 
but there were quarrels. The, the same words used in Greek for um, polemos, which could be arguments that are breaking out, or wars that are taking place, is being used here. James is talking on two different levels. He's saying that as you see quarrels taking place among you, they come from the very same place that these wars are taking place across the Roman Empire. This was a very troubling time in the early Christian period where we had these zealot movements that were, were going around causing a lot of trouble for the Romans. We had all different, there, there was a lot of instability where um, Germanic tribes and others would come in and cause troubles around the borders of Rome. We see this taking place and James is speaking on the local level as well as the global level saying that these wars and fights that you see taking place have the very same root. And what is that root here according to James chapter 4 and verse 1? They come from your desire for pleasure. So many of us think that if we, f we give in to our natural inclinations and, and we give in to those desires for pleasure, that it doesn't affect anyone else. Are you with me on that, church? When I give in to temptation, it's not going to affect anyone else. I can do this on my own and it's not going to affect anyone. But we see very clearly that when we give in to that desire for pleasure that that not only has an effect on those that we come into contact with in our community, but on a global scale we see the wars and the instability as a natural result of us giving in to our desire for pleasure. Is that new to anyone today? The wars that we see around us, the instability that we see around us on a global scale is a mere result of what James is talking about here. Us gratifying our desire for pleasure. On a global scale, we see absolute turmoil. On a local level, we see inner turmoil. These same things are playing out on a global scale as we see taking place in our very own hearts. Do you mind just going to the next slide? I'm not sure why this isn't working today. It's your desire for pleasure that is fueling your inner turmoil. Your desire for pleasure fuels your inner turmoil. Next slide, if you don't mind. Selfishness robs you of joy. This is such an interesting point. Notice that as we give in to our own desire for pleasure, what naturally takes place? War inside of us. War in our members, war in our congregation, war on a global scale. When each one of us gives in to our natural inclination to sin, war is the natural result. How many of us have spent time around two-year-olds? Hands up if you've spent time around two-year-olds. I don't have a two-year-old personally, but I've spent seconds with two-year-olds, and that has been enough to know what I'm about to share with you. But for a two-year-old, they want what everyone else has. And am I correct in saying that? A two-year-old will see someone else playing with something, and they will throw whatever they have and go after what that other person has, which is bringing them joy. Is that correct or not? Parents, am I on the same page or not? A two-year-old sees what someone else has, sees what someone else is enjoying, and they go and try and take it off them. And if they cannot get it with their beautiful, cute little smiles, then they are going to take it by force. They are going to do whatever it takes to get what that person has, which is bringing them joy. And once they get it, are they satisfied? For a few seconds, maybe. Did you know that we all have a two-year-old alive inside of us? People remind me of this all the time. Not because I'm running around snatching toys, but just because not all of the time am I as mature as I would like to be. But each of us have a two-year-old living inside of us where we see someone else enjoying something. And something says within us, you need to get that. You need that. 
you need what that is producing in their life. And so we go after it, don't we, church? Do we do that? Or am I just talking to myself here? We see what someone else has, and so we go after it. Our desire for pleasure drives us. Our inclination towards sin drives us. And what does that do? It results in pain. It results in inner turmoil. It results in war. But that doesn't stop us. We get smarter and smarter and smarter about how to cover up the fact that we all have this little screaming two-year-old inside of us trying to get whatever we can whenever we want it. The Bible is making some clear applications to my immaturity today, but also to the wars and the conflicts that we see around us. Notice that James doesn't mention what the disputes are about. He doesn't mention what, war, what is causing these disputes what is causing these arguments in these local congregations. But that is kind of beside the point. James doesn't need to talk about the issue itself because there is a greater issue at hand, and that issue is the way that they are treating one another. The spirit by which you conduct yourself is what's important. James is making a very practical point here, and that is the way that you conduct yourself is almost as important, or more important, sorry, than the circumstances in which you find yourself. Can you agree with me, church? The spirit by which you conduct yourself, the way that you conduct yourself is more important than the circumstances that you find yourself in. For James, we find that his congregation was going through persecution. And that was no excuse for the behavior that we see taking place in the congregations. For us, maybe it's not religious persecution that we're facing. Maybe it's something in the home. Maybe it's something with other members at church. Maybe it's something in the workplace. But whatever the case is, the way that you conduct yourself is as important or even more critical than the circumstances in which you find yourself. In other words, be a Christian, not just when it's easy to be, not just at church where you're expected to be a Christian, but in all aspects of your life, in all circumstances that you find yourself in, live by the principles that the Bible teaches, the way that Christ taught us to live. Am I going to the next slide for me? Ah, there it is. We find Jesus using a similar idea or teaching here in Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. It says, now the ones that fell among the thorns. Jesus is talking about these seeds that are going out and being planted. He's using a parable here. And notice what happens to these these seeds that fall on this stony ground here. Now the ones that fell among the thorns, sorry, the thorny ground, are those who, when they have heard... The seed goes out, the word goes out in Jesus' parable, and once the seed goes out or the word goes out, they are choked with cares. And what are these things that are choking them? Riches, the pleasures of life, and that bring no fruit and maturity. Are you noticing what Jesus is saying here? That as the word goes out, that the pleasures of life or this desire for pleasure that we each find within ourselves chokes up the word, meaning that there is a war taking place where with us as Christians. The word goes out, we spend time in the word, but it is in direct conflict with the pleasures of life. And ultimately, the Bible says, ultimately, Jesus says, that that pleasure is going to choke the Word of God. That pleasure is going to drive out that desire that you have to spend time with Him. As Jesus was teaching His disciples, He saw that the pleasures of life were in direct conflict with His his teachings. And so we too must be careful that the pleasures of this world do not come in direct conflict with our faith. Where have we found a balance? Have we come to the point where we're willing to set aside the things that we care about, our pleasures, bringing self-gratification 
for the work of God, for the things that God is seeking to do in our lives. Let's continue reading here in James chapter 4 and verse 2. It says, you lust and do not have. It keeps getting worse here. You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have. Why? Why does James' audience not have what they are seeking after, what they are coveting after? It is because you do not ask. Because you do not ask. In Acts chapter 13, let's notice here, on the next Sabbath, almost the whole city came together to hear the Word of God. In Acts chapter 13, we see that Paul was preaching in the synagogues and the entire town was coming together to hear what Paul had to say. But this did something to the local Jewish leaders. It says, but when the Jews saw the multitudes, in other words, when the multitudes started following after Paul, this did something within the Jews. They were filled with what? Envy, the Bible says. They were filled with envy and contradicting and blaspheming, they opposed the things spoken by Paul. We have just seen in James chapter 4 and verse 2 that we murder and we covet or we envy because we do not have. And that is exactly what is taking place here as the early church leaders, as the apostle Paul goes out and begins preaching, these local leaders, the Pharisees, see what is taking place and they get envious, they get jealous to the point where they are looking to take his life. We see a practical illustration of what James is talking about here. This is a real issue in the early church. This is a very big deal for the early church. James is speaking here into what is taking place in their local congregations. If you continue to act out your evil passions, murder will ensue. I do not believe that James's congregations were going around killing one another. I do not believe that, that we as Christians, nice little Christians sitting here in church today, would be willing to take someone's life. But what the Bible says is when we continue to live out these passions, when we continue to fulfill this self-gratification that we all have burning within us, murder will ensue. Murder is the natural result. We may not think that we are capable of murder today, but our actions tell a different story. Our actions tell a different story. The way that we treat people when no one's looking tells a different story. Douglas Moo, in his commentary, says, With penetrating insight, James provides us with a powerful analysis of human conflict. This is on a global scale. Verbal argument on a local level. Private violence. And then national conflict. In other words, what is taking place here on a local level? What is taking place in the human heart? As we see national conflicts, it's just a greater example of what is happening, this inner turmoil that we each find within us. All can be traced back to the wrongful lust to want more than we have. All of this, Mu says, can be traced back to this desire to have more than we have. Do any of us have that desire, that inclining within us to be more than what we are, to have more than what we currently own or possess? Do do we struggle with this church? I believe that we do. And what Mu is saying here is that as this is played out, conflict ensues. To be envious of and covet what others have, whether it be their position or their possessions. This, all of this can be traced from this very heart. We cannot take by force what God is offering freely. Can we say amen, church? We cannot take by force what God is offering freely. There is irony in this, isn't there? That we as human beings, through self-gratification, try and take by force 
what God is offering to each one of us freely. Why is it that we would need to even try and take by force what God is offering freely? It is because we have this burning desire, this passion within us to fulfill our own needs at the expense of those around us. James chapter 1 and verse 5 here says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all what? Liberally, James says, and without reproach, and it will be given to him. In other words, it could be said that God is a liberal. God gives to each one liberally, and what is he willing to give? That which we ask for, and in this context, it is wisdom. And in the greater context of James, wisdom that is heaven sent is going to be the thing that overcomes this worldliness that each of us struggle within ourselves. Wisdom from heaven is what you were lacking. When you sense this inner turmoil, when you see, when you relate to what is being spoken of this morning, it is wisdom that is heaven sent that we are lacking. It is not a position. It is not someone's possessions. It is wisdom from God that we are lacking. Can I get an amen to that, church? We need heavenly wisdom. We need a complete transformation. Let's continue reading here in James chapter 4 and verse 3. It says, You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Here is why we, God is not able to give. It is because when we ask, we ask amiss, meaning that we are going to use whatever we get from God, whatever we can get from those around us on ourselves. And therefore, God is not able to give to that cause. God didn't give me what I wanted, therefore, God does not exist. Have we heard that before, church? God did not give me what I wanted. God was not willing to fulfill my desires, therefore he must not exist. Who is Lord of the universe? In this situation, I make myself God. The God of the Bible is nowhere to be seen. God bestows not gifts only, but the enjoyment of them. Can I get an amen to that, church? God bestows not gifts only, but the enjoyment of them, but the enjoyment which contributes to nothing beyond itself. Notice this. The enjoyment which contributes to nothing beyond itself is not what he gives in answer to prayer. And petitions to him which have no better end in view are not prayers. We can think that we're praying all we want to. We can think that it is a righteous prayer that we are praying when we ask God to fulfill our desires. But what Moo says, and I have to agree, is that that is not a prayer. We are merely trying to use God to get what we want all along. Jesus picks up this thought and speaks to this very issue when he says, Ask, and it will be given unto you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone, and if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? I love this passage. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask Him? Amen? God gives us that which we need, not what we want. God, the Father, our Father in heaven, gives us what we need when we ask for it. Don't ask amiss. Don't merely ask so that you can gratify yourself. If you ask with clear intentions, God is willing to give. Liberally, the Bible says. Your Father who is in heaven will give good gifts to those who ask Him. Let's continue reading here in verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. 
James is really giving it to his audience this morning. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. You make yourself a friend with the world. You have made yourself an enemy with God. James gathers up all the specific issues that he deals with in his letter into one all-embracing demand. Here, if anywhere, we find the heart of James' letter. Notice what Douglas Moo is saying here. If you were to go through the book of James and summarize all of the issues that he deals with, the things that James speaks out against, it has been culminated into one passage here in James chapter 4, and we are getting into the very heart of what James is talking about. Here in James chapter 4 and verse 4, these people are committing adultery. These people that are claiming to be Christians, that are sitting in church every week, they are religious on the outset. But on the heart, there is something totally different taking place. We are talking about a religious experience here. A religious experience. Not just on the outward, but in the heart. And James is getting to the very heart of the matter here as he talks about what it means to have a religious experience. For your maker is your husband, it says in the book of Isaiah. The Lord of hosts is his name, and your redeemer is the holy one of Israel. He is called the God of the whole earth. There is often this motif used in Scripture where we are relate to God as a husband. We, the church, or Israel, the church, relates to God as the husband. And we see this carrying through Scripture, and we see this very much so happening here in the book of James. Jeremiah picks up this thought and says, Surely as a wife treacherously departs from her husband, so have you dealt treacherously with me, O house of Israel, says the Lord. In other words, when Jeremiah summarized the, their experience with God, when, when Jeremiah summarized the Israelites' experience, the way that they related to God, yes, God was the husband, but they had committed adultery. They had committed adultery, and that is exactly, James is using this motif here. He's picking up this Old Testament imagery, and he is saying that we have committed adultery before God. Friends, I want to be clear. When we become friends with the world, when we embrace worldliness, we are committing adultery with God. The Bible says that you cannot serve two masters. And that is very much the case here. It is serious what we are talking about this morning. There are so many of us that feel comfortable committing adultery with God. There are so many of us this morning that feel comfortable and are able to justify in their own minds committing spiritual adultery. We would never do it in our community. We would never do it in our congregation. But when it comes to our relationship with God, we are more than happy to be friends with the world at the cost of our relationship with our Heavenly Father. Friends, Being a friend of the world is being an enemy with God. Make your decision wisely. Ask yourself the question, is what I am doing, is the way that I am conducting myself, is it compromising my ability to relate to God? Is it compromising my ability to have a relationship with God? Am I, as James is saying, committing adultery with God? The abrupt and harsh, you adulterous people, marks the beginning of one of the most strongly worded calls to repent we find anywhere in the New Testament. This is a heavy call to repentance this morning, church, and I hope that it's, it's speaking to each one of us. We cannot be friends with the world and call ourselves Christians at the same time. 
we have heard James say over and over and over that this double-mindedness, that these double standards that we hold, it is not appropriate and it will erode, it will undermine our religious experience, meaning that we will never be able to have a real religious experience. We have no evidence that James' readers were overtly disclaiming God and consciously deciding to follow the world instead. In other words, we, we don't see evidence from what James is saying that, that they were, were bringing idols into the church or that they were doing anything overtly. But their tendency to imitate the world, and notice J- uh, Douglas Moo is about to tell us how they have been imitating the world through discriminating against people. Do we discriminate against people, church? If so, if you can relate to any of these things, we are going to see that we have allowed worldliness, worldly thinking to come into our Christian experience, discriminating against the world, uh, against the people, by speaking negatively of others. Do we speak negatively of others today, church? Could it be said of us that we are critical of other people? He goes on to say, by exhibiting bitter envy and selfish ambition, in other words, being after people's possessions or position, and pursuing their own destructive pleasures, they amounted to just that. Worldliness has crept into the church Has it come in through your influence? Has it come in through your life? Has it come in through the way that you are living? We just took a sharp turn. God's love is consistent. God's love is consistent. Notice here in verse 4. Adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy with God. You see, double-minded men and women are Satan's best allies. Double-minded men and women are Satan's best allies. Whatever favorable opinion, Ellen White says, they may have of themselves, they are what? Dissemblers. We say that we are working for the unity of God's kingdom. We say that we are working to build up His kingdom here in this area. But as we are double-minded, as we bring in these double standards to the church, Satan is working through us to undermine God's ability to act. Let's continue reading here in verse 5. Or do you not think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? I'm having a real issue with this clicker this morning. I'm very sorry about that. In Exodus chapter 20 and verse 5, this theme of jealousy comes up in the scriptures. I want you to notice very clearly that now the tables have turned. The language is being used, the the language that was used to describe our coveting positions or our coveting others' possessions is now the way that God is describing the way that He feels for us. Incredible. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a what? A jealous God. Did you know that God is jealous this morning? He is jealous of you. He is jealous of the way that you spend your time. He is jealous of the way that you relate to others. He does not want you to be committing a spiritual adultery because he has made himself available as a husband to a woman. As one who is pursuing a woman, he has pursued us this morning. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Why is the Holy Spirit yearning for us? Why is God yearning for us today? It is because we were bought with a price. 
Church, your life has significance this morning because Jesus died for you. Your life as an individual sitting here in Kingscliff Seventh Adventist Church this morning has significance, eternal significance. We could not even measure your worth if we were to try. Why? Because God paid the ultimate price so that you could live. And today we are seeing very clearly in Scripture that as the Spirit yearns for us, it's because He has pursued us with everything that heaven has to offer. Heaven has already given of all its resources this morning so that you can spend eternity with God. And we turn away from this and we seek after the things that the world seeks after. We see all that God is willing to give us and we still go after what the world is offering us this morning. As much as we are pursuing our own gratification, God is pursuing us. The Spirit yearns jealously for us. This same language is being employed. James is being smart in the way that he is communicating that the way that you covet after what the world is offering is the same way that God is coveting, is jealously yearning to be in a right relationship with you. Church, as much as you desire that position, as much as you desire someone else's possessions, as much as you sit there thinking about how you can get what you want, God is thinking about you. God spends time thinking about you. God spends time thinking about you and the things that you enjoy doing. And God is jealously yearning for time with you this morning. God is jealously yearning for an experience with you. Let's continue reading here in verse 6. It says, but he gives more grace. Can I get an amen for that, church? But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. There is more where that came from, is what James is saying. How many of us have experienced grace in our lives? How many of us have experienced an overflow of God's abundant grace? There is more where that came from. There is more where that came from. God continues to yearn jealously over us. God continues to do whatever it takes to seek after you, to seek that right relationship with you. He is willing to do whatever it takes to be in a relationship with you. God's gift is enjoyed only by those willing to accept it. Not by those willing to, uh, looking to take it by force, but by those willing to accept it. I wonder if there's anyone here this morning looking to accept God's gift of grace. God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility is the precursor to accepting God's grace. Let's continue reading here in verse 7. It says, Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. To submit to God means to place ourselves under His Lordship and therefore to commit ourselves to obey Him in all things. Many of us get confused in the hierarchy. Many of us get confused thinking that we are in control and that we are trying to bring God along for the ride. Friends, when we place God at the helm, when, when God is in control of our lives, that is the happiest we can ever be. Can I get an amen, church? When God is in control of your life, that is the happiest that you will ever be. If you are struggling this morning, if there are things that are burdening you, if you have been in inner turmoil, if you have seen that play out into greater conflicts in your life, then maybe the answer is to place God at the helm to get that relationship right and allow that to affect all others. When we work on the vertical, when we allow God to align himself vertically, it naturally 
fixes the horizontal problems that we find ourselves in. This word submit means to put in order where? Under, not over. Many of us want to be in control. But when we put God in control over us, that is the best place that we could ever be. In 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4, it says, He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Amen. He who is in you, he who is alive and working in me, is greater than he who is in the world. And when we submit ourselves to God and resist the devil, guess what? He will flee from us. So many of us are toying with the devil. So many of us are giving him room in our lives. When we resist the devil, he will flee from us. The Bible promises, he that is in you is greater than he that is in the world. We have a greater power in us this morning, church, than he that is in the world. Many of us like to focus our attention to what the devil is doing. Many of us like to focus our attention and try and get to the bottom of every single conspiracy there ever was. Every way that the devil is working. But he that is in us is greater than he that is in the world. When we figure out what God is seeking to do in our lives, let the devil flee from us. Let the devil have nothing to do with us. We are entertaining the devil in our lives, church. Let's stop committing adultery this morning. Let's resist the devil. Let's make a stand to resist the devil, to not give him any room in our lives. And let's watch him flee. Is that your prayer this morning? Do you want to see the devil run and flee? Do you want to see God's power at work in your life? The Bible gives us a simple equation. Submit to God. Put Him first. Align yourself under God and watch the devil run away. Resist the devil and watch him flee. Watch him cower. We need this church. We need to see God's power in our lives. We need to see God's power in our families. We need to see God's power in our workplaces. We need to see God's power at work in our community. Let's resist the devil. Let's submit to God. And let's watch what God can do. Resistance must be firm and steadfast, Ellen White says. We lose all we gain if we resist today only to what? Yield tomorrow. We are strong today, but are we as strong as we were today on a Sunday or on a Monday or on a Tuesday? Let's hold firm today only to hold firmer tomorrow. Let's not let the devil get any room in our lives, gain any ground. Let's continue to resist day after day. As a church, let us come together and encourage one another. Let's finish off this passage together this morning. In verse 8, it says, Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. And what will He do? He will lift you up this morning. Friends, we have people gathered here this morning that need to resist the devil, that need to put God first in their life, that need to put God over an area of their life. I wonder if that's you. I wonder if this week you've been struggling to put God first in your finances, I wonder if this week you've been struggling to put God first in your relationship. I wonder if this week you've been struggling to put God first in your career. I wonder if this week you have been struggling to put God first in the way that you relate to others. 
Friends, when we align ourselves, putting ourselves under God, when we humble ourselves, the Bible promises that He will lift us up. We look at those around us that are being lifted up. We look at those around us that God is able to work through and we say, I want what they have. But we aren't willing to do what they have done in humbling themselves before God. Friends, let it not be said of us that we were not willing to submit to God, that we were not willing to do whatever it took before God in order to have the humility that only He can produce in our lives. We are about to witness a baptism, and I believe that this is a culmination in this individual's life, we are going to witness Vessie give her heart to Christ. Many of you have come from near and far to watch Vessie give her heart to Jesus this morning. This baptism is a culmination of what James has been encouraging us to do here. James is saying that you've been flirting with the world. You've been committing a spiritual adultery with the world, and it's time to stop. It's time to put an end to that, and it's time to put God first in your life. And this morning, Vessie has said that she wants to put herself first. We are going to have the, the team come up and share a special item with us shortly. But first of all, Mel's going to be reading her testimony and notice these themes coming out as we've read through James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Notice these themes coming out as we see Vessie give her heart to the Lord. Friends, I just want to make it clear that we, when we align ourselves under God, that that is the happiest place that we could ever be. When we bring ourselves in under God... That is the happiest place that you could ever exist. The Bible is full of promises for those that are willing to submit themselves to God. One of those being having the devil flee from us. If that's been you today, church, then I encourage you to come and talk to me after the service. If you needed to hear this message this morning, I really encourage you to come and talk to me after the service. I would love to come alongside you and to support you in that journey. And I'm sure many more of us here at church would love to be able to support you as you align yourself with God. I'm going to run out the back and get ready for the baptism. Thank you so much for uh, being with us through this presentation this morning.